And on piano, our musical director, Mtoko Zizmabuza. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> on bass, Elviro Fruolek. <laughs> on drums, Sakino Mbozolo. On trumpet, Sakile Simani. Wow. And on tenor saxophone, Joesh Subramani. <laughs> and we are Dumza Maswana. <laughs> we are going to now sing uh, of Mephisus Gumani. I wanted to do this wonderful piece by Mama U Sylvia Mdunyelwa, Ndombo Zuko. She says this song is for her daughter. She's telling her that, hush, little one, everything will be fine. Ndombo Zuko.
Deus Mabuza. It's a meeting, 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 it's
But we have kept our promise last year. Dumza, you'll be happy to know. Last year, we said, let's hear them speak. And then we said, this year, we are going to speak truth to power. So this is a second installment of the joint public lecture between the University of Forte and Nelson Mandela University. And colleagues, I don't want to waste your time already. We are running a little bit late, but we are enjoying the music. I just need to, for the sake of recording, and Dumza for the sake of archives, I need to read his biography properly so that the future generation may know that he was playing here and also he's one of... Um, the beautiful musicians that we have in South Africa, who fuses tradition, spirituality, and jazz to create a sonic experience that uplift, inspire, and heal. His lyrical prowess, wide vocal range that you have heard, and authenticity earned him a summer nomination in 2016 with his debut album, Molo. You might know that song, Iti Andiko. And then it says, tell them I'm not here. Why did you borrow me money when you know that I am unemployed? <laughs> when they come to collect, tell them I'm not here. That is the direct translation of that song. It's a beautiful song by Idumza. And he has performed uh, in different spaces, including Edinburgh Festival Scotland, uh, in Sing Festival in Canada, Toronto. He's also performed in Makanda Arts Festival, Makufe, Ebubeleni, Kuyele Kaya, and so forth and so forth. But also his latest and third album, titled Celebrating African Song, has been produced by the award-winning and globally celebrated South African jazz pianist and producer, Andy Leyenana. Thank you, Dumza and the band. Please give him a round of applause. <laughs> Colleagues, let me apologize in advance. The VC of University of Forte could not be here physically, but he's waiting for us online. His name is Professor Sakela Bushungu. He is the Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of Forte, 
since 2017 and was confirmed for his second term in 2021. Uh, previously, he was the Dean of Humanities at the University of Cape Town and a Deputy Dean of Humanities and Social Sciences at the University of Pretoria. Before that, he held several senior academic positions uh, at different universities in South Africa, including VETS, UJ, and Pretoria. But currently, he is uh, the one that is hosting us today. Over to you, Vice Chancellor. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor uh, Magotwana. And uh, once again, greetings to everyone. And it's unfortunate I couldn't be here. I couldn't be there with you today. I had to leave Alice for an emergency, um, which is uh, resolved now. Uh, first of all, let me take this opportunity to welcome everyone in attendance today. Uh, as uh, uh, Professor Magotwan has said, this is installment no number two and there will be many, many, many more installments, hundreds uh, of installments. Uh, this is a joint uh, public lecture. Uh, it's called the Dr. Phyllis Ndanta and Prudence Mabele a public lecture. It's joint, but it's, 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 it's unique in, in, in its own way. One, it's a public lecture that that's, uh, uh, celebrates two uh, iconic women and uh, it rotates. It's therefore hosted by Nelson Mandela University and the University of Fort Hare. Uh, and it rotates every year. That's the agreement. Ella Dinga, Tetangalo, Professor Magokwan. So last year, the inaugural public lecture was at Nelson Mandela, where we all converged and uh, had uh, two uh, uh, very, very uh, interesting speakers. So this year, it's at Fort Hare. And then next year, will gather in this fashion again at, uh, at uh, Nelson Mandela. It's all organized and hosted by very, very important kind of uh, institutes in our, in, our, in our universities. At the University of Fort Hare, the, the host is the chair, uh, the NRF Sachi chair in sexualities, genders, and queer studies, uh, headed by Professor Zet Mutebeni. And then at the University of at Nelson Mandela University, it's hosted under the uh, chair, Sachi chair in African feminist imaginaries, uh, headed by Professor Pumla Gola. And of course, also by the Center for Women and Gender Studies, uh, headed by Professor Magokwan. So we're very proud of this very unique uh, experiment, unique in terms of collaboration, a very true and 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 authentic and uh, um, organic professor to professor kind of relationship, and it's, we were very proud that we have uh, this arrangement with our neighbors, neighboring institution. And of course, um, there are many other interactions between us uh, as, as universities. There's lots of working together. There's lots of of, of uh, 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 collaborations. We sign a lot of. A kind of agreements uh, for, for work of this kind. But this one stands out and it's, it is an annual lecture. It is an annual lecture. But before I get into uh, you know, a few remarks about, about the lecture itself, uh, let me first acknowledge uh, the pe people present here. As, as always, as is the tradition now, uh, both families uh, send represent, re representatives to the public lecture. This year, the Mabele family is represented by uh, Mr. Zalina Mabele and Mr. Musa Mabele. They, they are here in the audience with us today. From the Ntandela side uh, and Balfour side, the Ntandela and Balfour side families, it's re represented by Simpiwe and Ntandela. I think he was there last year, if I recall. Uh, Mr. Sakio Balfour and uh, Ms. Uh, Tabisa Balfour. So that we're very proud that they are here. So we're not doing it about their members, the family members in their absence, we're talking up to them about them uh, uh, and we're celebrating together. And then from the university, from Nelson Mandela University, there are several senior people who are in attendance and I'm not gonna be able to name all of them, but let me acknowledge uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor Andre Keat, who is here and we, who's, who's also on the program. Uh, the Dean of Social Sciences and Humanities, Professor Pumla, uh, Pamela Maseko is also here. 
is also on the program, uh, Dr. Jenny Dupree, who is the Chair for Critical Studies in Higher Education and Transform Transformation at Nelson Mandela University, Mr. Alan Zinn, Zin, Coordinator of Mandela Press, Nelson Mandela University Press, and then, of course, the, uh, the, the organizing committee from that side, led by Professor Magokwana and Professor Gola. And then from our university, the University of Fort Hare, there are several, there are several uh, senior colleagues who are there. Um, I, I, I should, I should, I should, Professor Neil Roos is the is the is the, is, the, is the dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities at uh, UFH. Uh, Dr. Matlako is the director of postgraduate studies. Uh, Dr. Connie Bizzo is the director of libraries at the university, and Ms. Nontlanta uh, Moyo, who is the director of our gen gen gender prevention unit. Um, uh, she joined us recently. Um, then, of course, there are other friends and visitors who come from far and wide, and again, uh, time does not permit uh, that I, not, I recognize all of them. But I'm going to be partial to these three because I know them and I've worked with them before, some of them at least. Uh, and so it's nice for me to name drop at this point. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim Stein from the University of Mpumalanga is, is in attendance and they welcome uh, Dr. Stein. Uh, good, good to see you virtually at least. Uh, Dr. Samkezim Mkubala Ngwenya from the University of Limpopo is also in attendance. And of course, again, let me name drop, uh, Dr. Sander Abenya from the University of Cape Town is also in the audience. There are others and uh, I will mention them uh, if, if, time, if time permits. Um, let's all, let me also then uh, acknowledge without listing or naming them, various organizations uh, that are represented here from civil society, from ed the education sector, and so on and so forth. They're all um, here and welcome to all of them. Dumza, Dumza Maswana, uh, 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 just one thing that I'm regretting today about not being there is three things. He's not to, uh, being there to listen to D Dumza and shake his hand because his music is just, it touches something. And um, once again, uh, we're very pleased and thanks Dumza for being available for, for this uh, for this occasion. It's very fitting um, and very f fitting. I, I met, I had occasion to meet uh, uh, Dr. Dandal, uh, back in, in 2007 or so at Vets. Very feisty, very feisty uh, 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 woman, very strong, but also very grounded. Very grounded. I have no doubt she would have re uh, related to your music very well, uh, and and of course she came. She, she and her family were very much kind of very much uh, involved in cultural and other forms of expression. And so, um, thanks, thanks for to you and your band to, for for being here. There are hundreds and maybe a few thousand people who are listening to uh, who are going to listen to his lectures. Uh, via live stream, and once again, welcome and greeting to, uh, greetings to them too. Um, yeah, I, I think modern technology is a benefit because we gather at the Miriam Makeba Center. It's not a big venue, but it's a big venue because of live streaming. Welcome to all of them. And then, of course, I, something about the two guest speakers, and, and I'm, that's, the, the, that's, the, that's the other reason why I feel... I feel um, I feel sad I'm not there because I would have liked to be there and listen to Sbongi uh, Lendashe and Dr. Stella Nyazi in person, uh, face to face. And also like like Dumza Maswan shake their hands. But um <clears throat> but uh, I, I I unfortunately it's not it's not like that. I'm not gonna introduce them because there is a special item on there's an item on the agenda uh, introducing the speakers. But I think in these two uh, speakers, we have a formidable pair uh, who can genuinely, genuinely speak truth to power, like the two women that we are celebrating. And uh, I think the activities of both, um, both uh, uh, Ms. Bongil and Daja operating from Gauteng, 
and uh, Ms. Stella uh, Nyanzi operating from, from Uganda. Um, these, they, they, the roles that they play, it uh, gives expression, true expression to, this, to the saying of speaking truth to power. And once again, welcome to them, and I look forward to listening to 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 their to their words of of, of wisdom and 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 courage. And so, so the, the the chairs, as I said, I've made made the point about the collaboration between the chairs. And uh, once again, I just want to congratulate once again the two professors here, uh, Professor Zetu Matebeni uh, from Forte and Professor Gola for 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 for. for for kind of getting this this idea off the ground and and keeping the ball and running with the ball, and uh, we know and I I have no doubt that in their hands and uh, 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 on their watch, this joint lecture will continue for many many years to come. And one thing I I, I look forward to uh, in future is that these chairs as well as this this public lecture. Will be it will stimulate and trigger uh, many young people uh, to to get interested in the works and and activities and contributions of Phyllis Ndandala and Prudence Mavelli. With those words, let me welcome all of you to Fort Hare. Feel free, take your jackets off, even if it's winter. You'll see that that house, that room there, is very warm with the music and with the speakers. It will be warmer. You don't need those jackets and coats. Thank you very much, Program Director, and, and welcome to everyone. Thank you so much, Vice Chancellor. Oh, now I'm to Pa, as if he can see me. <laughs> That's the beauty of technology. So, hello, uh, Vice Chancellor, fellow sociologists, what, what, all of those things. But anyway, time. I'm not going to spend too much time explaining why we decided to come together between um, the to myself and Pumla in order to collaborate on this uh, uh, beautiful public lecture. Um, I'm hoping that later on between Pumla and the two, they can speak to some of the reasons why we saw it fit to celebrate these uh, beautiful women activists, scholars, and also people who literally sacrificed all that they had so that we can be able to enjoy a little bit of freedom, uh, 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 many of us. Obviously, uh, uh, our university vice chancellor, Professor Mutua, also could not be here, but she is being represented by Professor uh, Andre Kiet and Professor Pamela Maseko, who is next in the program. Professor Pamela Maseko, is the executive dean of the Faculty of Humanities at Nelson Mandela University. Her scholarship is located in social linguistics and language policy and planning, and has focused on the effects of language and planning in education in African multilingual contexts. Prof. Maseko has worked at Northwest University, Rhodes University, and the universities of Cape Town, Western Cape, and the University of Western Cape. She has also held several fellowships in different universities, including the University of London School of Oriental and African Studies, as well as uh, a Jaius, Johannes Beck Institute of Advanced Studies. Colleagues, friends, my name is Baba Lama Kokwana. I am the Interim Director of the Center for Women and Gender Studies. Please welcome Professor Pamela Maseko. Program Director, Professor Makotwana, um, the Mabele and Tantala and Balco families uh, here, Vice Chancellor of the University of Forte, Professor Sakela Bushungu, uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor of our University, Professor Andre Kiet. Um, my colleague, uh, Professor Neil Ross, uh, 
uh, the executive dean of the humanities faculty at Forte. Our keynote speakers um, of today, uh, Ms. Mongilenda Shen, Dr. Stella Nyanzi, all staff and students from the two universities um, who are co-hosting this lecture today that is honoring two extraordinary women. Um, all the universities here, uh, I just spoke to Baba Lona when I was asking how many universities are here. And I think this is amongst the few um, occasions where we represented by at least eight universities. So we have UCT here represented by Asande. We have got Limpompo, we've got Walter Sisulu University. We've got University of Mbalanga represented by Ibrahim. We've got um, Forte, we've got Rhodes, we've got Nelson Mandela University. So I think we should give, give ourselves a big um, so thank you so much. And of course, uh, I want to acknowledge um, the artist, uh, Dumza uh, Maswana. And uh, I understand the envy of um, the vice chancellor that he can be here. Uh, I do come with greetings from our vice chancellor as well, who could not be here because of the pressing commitment um, at the university, and um, he gives apologies, um, uh, Babalwa uh, Zetu. Uh, she would have liked to be here, but um, needed to do what needed to be done at home. Um, everybody um, here uh, listening virtually as well, Manene na Manene Kazi Diabolis. I am extremely thrilled um, to be given an opportunity to speak just briefly about the collaboration between Nelson Mandela University and the University of Forte around the scholarship on genders, sexualities, queer and um, women's studies. And in the spirit of Ubuntu, it is becoming evident now, more than ever before, that for universities to be driving relevant, impactful, and wide-reaching research for societal prog progress, institutional collaborations such as this one for regional and global application and impact are necessary. It's a, gro it's a great joy um, as a dean, and I'm sure I'm speaking for Neil here um, as well, to be seeing this collaboration between the regional universities of the province work in such an extra extraordinary and meaningful way. This collaboration between our university and Forte University seeks to develop a gender corridor in the Eastern Cape and to link universities and scholars dealing with questions of gender, sexualities, queerness, womanhood from an African perspective. Sequenza o Kongo Kujonga, Nokufunda Nzulu, Ngobome Babandu, Besfaza Nabantundu, Ngokutubungu, La Nokufunda, Ingungane, Nenga Mango, Kwimiba Yonke Yobome. In other words, they do this, I was trans, I'm translating that, which I said in Kosa. They do this by profiling African women's biographical intellectual histories. Amazing work. Um, Zetu, Babalwa, and, and Prof. Gon. Where is Tuba? Kubalek Legakulu, we don't get to acknowledge you. Um, and I know Prof. Uh, Sakela has done so. For the same reasons that she's actually highlighted you and named you, just to, to motivate um, young scholars, young women, I need to also acknowledge you. Um, uh, so, um, just go there. I need to recognize you for having made meaning to this great project. Um, I need to acknowledge Professor Tumatebeni, who is a professor of sociology. I need to say professor of sociology, um, and also the NRF chair in sexualities, genders, and queer studies hosted by the University of Forte. 
I also want to acknowledge Professor Pumla Gola, a professor of literal and cultural studies and the such a chair in African Feminist Imaginations at Nelson Mandela University. Um, lastly, Prof. Babalwa Makokwana, who is an associate professor of sociology and the, in and the interim director, soon to be director of the Center for Gender and Women's Studies at Nelson Mandela University. By recognizing these women, the two women, um, Ufilis Ndandala, no Prudence Mabele, we are recentering them. We are hoping that this, this gesture begins to place them in their right place in history and that their intellectual contributions and thoughts will begin to inform ways of producing knowledge in institutions such as universities, not only here, but globally. Remember, we're producing knowledge. We, not, we don't want to be, to be parochial, but we want this to have global impact as well. Babalwa, as I come towards the end, um, the collaboration between African feminists um, here, the three scholars um, located at these three universities is bold, exciting, and a testament to the enduring power of feminist voices in South Africa and beyond. This is a historic moment for many of us as we envision the various ways in which higher education institutions in the Eastern Cape can engage in intellectual projects that foster regional and national partnerships and can contribute to shifting the nature of memorialization of women to make it part of the curriculum and broader academic project in higher education. With these engagements, we are opening up possibilities um, of the Eastern Cape, of the Eastern in Africa becoming a producer, sort of the Eastern Cape in Africa, becoming a producer of knowledge rather than faithful consumers and reproducers of Western forms of knowledge. We are greatly honored, highly honored to be addressed today by great excellent gender activists um, in Osibongile, Osisibongile, Osisistela Nyanzi. Destrosa situ ukwanda kwa liwangu mtagati makwandi. Ngoska kwa. Thank you so much, Prof. Maseko. Um, Anfunu wakaopa. But it takes a lot of support from the leadership of these two universities and the resources of the universities to be able to hold a special lecture like this. It takes a lot of motivation and all sorts of things, but when the leaders promote and actively are committed to the academic project of this nature, it makes things very easy. Colleagues, I just want you to give a round of applause for the leaders of the two universities who have given resources. Thank you so much. Up next, we have um, a fellow dean of humanities here at the University of Forte, Professor Neil Rose. And uh, he's the, the Dean of Social Sciences and Humanities here. He is also one of the lead implementers of the South African Department of Higher Education and Training's National Collaborative Future Professors Program. In his body of work, he has published essays on social history in the journals of social history, historical journal, and international review of social history. And he has a book entitled Ordinary Whites in Apartheid Society from Indiana University Press. He has recently written on contemporary identity, white racial identity, masculinity, and racial violence in South Africa. I personally know Neil, a good friend. Thank you so much, Neil, for hosting us today. And please come and give us a note on the student essays. If you're looking at the booklet, 
Some of the student essays were written from last year, but Neil is coming to address us for this year's essays. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, you see, this is always a problem. I always have to, when I talk, I always have to make sure that I can, I can read my notes and that things are high enough or, no, or low enough because I'm not only too tall, but I'm, um, I'm really half blind and I, I can't speak if I can't see the notes. Um, I would like to especially welcome the Ntamtala and Mabele families. Um, and Thank you deeply for allowing us to gather and speak and exchange ideas in the names of your families. We deeply appreciate that. You are our most honored guest tonight, and we respect and thank you for that. Um, almost as honored are our two speakers, Ms. Ndashe and Dr. Nyanzi. We are very, very grateful for you coming and speaking with us and taking the time to think about the themes to stimulate us and help us cast a new intellectual project. Um, I think that part of working in the Eastern Cape, part of doing humanities in the Eastern Cape, is thinking what humanities in this region looks like. And we cannot do a carbon copy of work which is produced in the, metropolitan, in the metropolitan areas, including the metropolitan areas of our own country. That's not what we want. We want a version of the humanities, a version of the social science rooted deeply in the culture, the history, and the imagination of where we are, where our students come from, from whence we talk. That's where the intellectual power of universities like NMU and Fort Hare come from. So that's why I'm delighted about this lecture. When I've known Professor Maseku for a hell of a long time, um, and when I was about to move to, 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 to when I was about to flee the, the, the free state, with great glee I might add, um, stop laughing like that, Professor Keaton, you know exactly why. Um, but when I was about to flee the free state, I chatted with, 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 with someone who I always call my boss, Professor Maseko. And we spoke about what work we could do collaboratively to undertake this intellectual work in the humanities in the Eastern Cape. And we wanted to do something between the, the three or four institutions which are rooted here, although we couldn't find a contact at Wusu at that time. But unfortunately, we weren't able to, to carry that project ourselves very far. But the lecture has. The lecture is precisely and what we wanted. And in fact, I think it's far more ambitious than we ever imagined. So this is, for me, one of the highlights in the Fort Hare's, in the Fort Hare's sort of approach to the humanities and what we do. So I'm so happy that we're gathered today. Um, again, I, I, I reiterate Professor Maseko and, 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 and others. Um, I think the, 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 the VCs welcome to all of you. Um, and I'd like to thank the organizing team for bringing us together this evening. Um, when I go about organizing on a far more humble scale the Noni Jabavu lectures in our faculty, I realize that lecture organizing is not an easy thing. I have to make lots and lots of calls to, to Zaleka, who is my boss when it comes to organizing things. So thank you to the organizing team. We are here to engage, to think, to be stimulated, maybe made angry, evoked, provoked, and made to think in some way. This doesn't happen by, by magic. It happens by hard work over many months. Thank you especially to, to our Saatchi chair, um, Zetu. I speak from, from the Fort Hare perspective. Thank you 
Thank you to Pumla and to Babawa, the other professors who are involved in that. Um, we appreciate this, and what we like too um, is that you extend this out. Probably one of the most prosaic and, and self-indulgent types of scholarship one can imagine is 12 academics sitting around um, a table in a seminar room noisily eating biscuits and, and, and talking about obscure theorists from the Frankfurt School. Um, what we need to do is we need to be able to reach out beyond the halls of the university. Um, that's what, that's, what, that's what, what, what being a scholar is about. That's what being a contemporary scholar is about. That's what being an activist intellectual is about. And in fact, one of the only things I was proud of at Free State was, a, Andre will know about this, it was a series of public lectures we put on over a series of a year called Africa's Many Liberations, which was our, our biggest constituency, was, our biggest audience at that was, 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 was workers from the, from the Harwood. And how workers came to our lectures. And that's, that's, that's scholarship. And this is scholarship. This is where we need to be going. Now, last year we traveled down to Nelson and Mandela University and this public lecture was inaugurated with a, with a student competition around the, th the theme, Let's Hear Him Speak. Um, looking through the program, I see many, many of those pieces are, are published in, 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 in that little booklet. So that becomes an important artifact. Um, of that conference, um, I'm very, I, I didn't real, I hadn't seen this document before I got in this afternoon. I must confess, so I'm really happy to have that, and it'll give me something to read and think about um, in some of the more prosaic and longer meetings that those of us of the deanly persuasion are obliged to attend. Um, now, there was another competition this year. And in June, the team again sent out a call for submissions from, from, from undergraduate and postgraduate students and, and also small community-based organizations in the Eastern Cape in the honor of the legacies of Dr. Ntantala and Prudus, Prudence Mabele. And this, this year's competition sought to stimulate debates and create interventions and programs that speak truth to power on complex histories. That piqued my interest as someone who was once a historian. Um, now, contrary to weak, lazy cliches, history doesn't teach us how to learn from past mistakes. That's, that's rubbish that, that, that you find on page three of The Guardian and The New York Times, occasionally The Daily Maverick, I would suggest. Um, history, social history, subaltern history, People's history, history from below, insurgent history, radical history, if you like. It does something else. That's how we develop a consciousness that shows us that people can confront and they can change the world. This is history that, 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 that cultivates a spirit of defiance, of challenge, of opposition. And it happens in many societies. And, and this this spirit is what history, I think, most importantly bequeaths us. Um, now, it also allows us, this kind of history also allows us to focus our attention on the present in so many societies, post-colonial societies and other metropolitan societies. We see an unlovely version of the discipline, one which is complacent and well-fed and triumphalist. Um, telling stories about freedom and justice, alleged. But too often these happy narratives are just a disguise for other unfreedoms. People's history, history from the below, of the sort I outlined earlier, must help us mobilize and speak against such happy histories, such well-fed, complacent histories. As an example, I think in this country of histories of HIV and AIDS activism in the early part of the millennium, around the turn of the millennium, in the kind of I am an African moment in South African public life, um, with, along with this concomitant commitment to the idea of the African Renaissance and so on, um, those were ideas that 
dominated the triumphant tellings of South African history at the time. Yet, histories of HIV and AIDS activism show us that there were other and urgent struggles, how people lived and died and took on a state that had other priorities, and how these people won eventually. This um, is history speaking to power. Or as, as W.E. Du Bois would tell us, this is a version of history where the margin becomes the center of history, where we swap it around. And in so doing it, it gives us new imaginations, new ambitions, new sources of mobilization. And this, I believe, is the kind of history that most honors Dr. Ntantala and Ms. Prudence Mabele. Um, now, for this year's competition, entrants were required to come up with content based on creative works or public scholarship or advocacy programs which focused on the capacity of marginalized people in our society to speak up and out, um, like the HIV and AIDS, act AIDS activists of perhaps 20 years ago or so. And on behalf of the organizers, we'd like to thank students from the four regional universities, Fort Hare, Nelson Mandela, Rhodes, and Wusu, as well as small community-based organizations who who participated in this creative competition. Um, alas, though, um, the committee decided that for this year, um, they are not going to, to, to award a prize to a winner. There will be no winner this year. Um, there, were, there were around 15 entries, but to use a football metaphor, I think that we were, we were kind of cup-tied by, by examinations, vacation, and and... What do they call the next version of ex supplementary, supplementary examinations? Um, and students simply had other things to do. But if I look around the audience today, and I imagine more people being on the streaming thing, the lack of submissions which we got sure as heck doesn't mean a lack of interest because that's what I see today. Um, now, despite receiving a couple of entries, um, the committee felt that 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 none of them really failed to bring together the core aspects as per the themes of the com of, of the competition, nor to engage with the legacies of Dr. Ntantala and and Ms. Prudence Mabale. Um, but what the committee will do is send individual feedback, which we hope the entrants will use as a learning opportunity to participate in such in such contests. These contests are really, really important to help you think, to help you argue, to help you write, and to help you engage with that world. Um, and I think each entrance, each time one enters, one gets better at it. Um, in our faculty at the University of Fort Hare, we've got a, an, a research niche area and an honors program in liberation, heritage, and memory. And this, this group will um, I hope, especially its, its history collective workshop, provide a forum for students in the region. Because again, I go back to the idea that myself and my boss spoke about. Um, online allows us to easily have seminars where we don't sit in the same part of the Eastern Cape. Um, I hope that, that, this, that, this, that this collective workshop will, will, will provide a forum for students to, to develop and rehearse and defend arguments and debate arguments and to bring together some very rich methodologies which are represented by some of the people who are in the audience today. And as I conclude, um, for the legacies of Dr. Intantala and Prudence Mabele to live on, please allow me to borrow from, 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 from Sibungele Ndashe, who is one of our key speakers today. I quote, there's need to support women and the marginalized population who are treated as wrongdoers when they challenge the inherent norms and roles. But in truth, they are only seeking coherence when they defend rights and occupy spaces that are in tune with their own purpose in life. Thank you. Please enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you so much, Professor Ross. And, um, yeah, no, I'm short, so just keep up and down. It's okay. Um, thank you so much for clarifying 
why we did not have any winners this year. And I'm excited about the workshops that you're talking about to capacitate our students in terms of writing and to capacitate our students in terms of how to engage these kind of histories that um, he just spoke about. Colleagues, some of you have already met her. She is just a beautiful person beyond her scholarship. She is the one who was leading the LOC. Professor Zetuma Debin, she is the chair in sexualities, genders, and queer studies here at the University of Forte, a writer, a social scientist, filmmaker. Her work focuses on African queer studies. She collaborates a lot with activists, scholars, gender scholars, and uh, does a lot of interdisciplinary work. She has won several awards for her work, but also she has written quite a number of books. Colleagues, I'm not going to go through all the bio, it's here, but Zetu is here to introduce our speakers. Pagama Zetu! Molwen? Yes. yes. Uh, sure. Yeah, I think it's fine. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> we are in great company. What an honor it is for me to introduce you to our special guests today, Ms. Subogilindashe and Dr. Stella Nyanzi. What is truth? And who can speak truth? To what power? We have become accustomed to lies. That even the simplest of lies can perform the everydayness of truth. We know this so well in this country. We are lied to every day. Every day about electricity supply, about access to justice, about clean water, about dilapidating roads, about inefficiencies in hospitals. We are even lied to when we are dead. More so, we even lie to ourselves and still believe the lies. When our lives are governed by lies, is there a possibility for truth to emerge? Would we even know when truth appears? Perhaps today these are the questions we will be grappling with, provoked by Dr. Phyllis Ndandala and Prudence Mabele. You will remember when in 2006, Dr. Ndandala came back home and she, was, she fell ill. She was hospitalized at Nelson Mandela Academic Hospital in Tat. From that experience, she wrote an article which was published in the Daily Maverick. And she asked our government in the Eastern Cape, what are you doing sitting in Bisho when we are going to hospital to die? These places have become places of death and not life. You will remember Prudence Mabele when former president Jacob Zuma denied the fact and the act of raping Fezegile Tsukela Kuzwayo. And Prudence stood in defiance and said to all the women who were saying, burn the bitch, hands off our president. And she said, this is not my president. Today we are speaking truth to power, and these are the women who have led the way. We have invited thinkers, activists, fierce feminists, bold women, unafraid women, to help us think, shift, move, and take action. Award-winning author of many books, including What is Slavery to Me, Post-Colonial Slave Memory in Post-Apartheid South Africa, Rape, a South African Nightmare, Female Factory, to name a few, 
Professor Pumla Dinewakola is the National Research Chair in African Feminist Imagination at the Nelson Mandela University. She's a professor of literally, literary and cultural studies. She will be in conversation today with our two distinguished guests. Professor Kola, will you please come to the front? <clears throat> Sibongi Lendashe is the leading voice in gender and women's and sexual minorities' human rights in this continent. If you didn't know her today, you better know her. She is the executive director of the Initiative for Strategic Litigation in Africa, ISLA in short, a pan-Africanist organization that works on women's human rights and sexual rights. Sibongi Le founded the organization in 2014. Ms. Ndasha has a law degree from the University of the Western Cape. She has worked at the Legal Resources Center, at the South African Constitutional Court, as an attorney at the Women's Legal Center, and at Interrights as the lead lawyer on equality in Africa. Among her wealth of experience, Ms. Ndasha litigates on sexual rights and women's human rights and has been developing jurisprudence in gender and sexuality before the African human rights systems. ISLA, her organization, has litigated on a number of cases in Africa, including women, women's land and property rights, protection of women's rights on separation, divorce, and annulment of marriage, forced sterilization in Africa, human trafficking, and the rights of LGBTIQ plus people in Africa. Ms. Ndashe, would you please join us? Here? Dr. Stella Nyanzi. Stella is a mul multiple award-winning medical anthropologist, dissident poet, human rights activist, and opposition politician from Uganda. I know many of you know her from her elaborate Facebook posts and have followed her since her explosive altercation with the president of Uganda, Yoweri Museveni. I know her as a loving mother to three beautiful children, a sister, and a great friend. Currently, Dr. Nyanzi is a scholarship holder of the Writers in Exile program of Penn Centrum Deutschland. She's based in Germany as an exilee. She obtained her doctoral degree from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. She has studied at the University, of, uh, University College London and Makerere University in Uganda. She is a prolific published scholar with academic publications in queer African studies, African feminist studies, masculinity studies, and sexual reproductive health rights. She has published poetry, poetry anthologies, including, and listen to the titles, because this Stella likes her mouth. <laughs> the titles including No Roses from My Mouth, Poems from Prison, Don't Come in My Mouth, Poems that rattled, uh, <laughs> poems that rattled Uganda, eulogies of my mouth, poems of a poisoned Uganda. And as I said, her mouth and her pen are powerful weapons. Dr. Nyanzi, please join us. <laughs> she has traveled for many days to come here. Her visa almost denied, having to get all kinds of activities from South Africa to help her get her here, and eventually she's here 72 hours later from traveling. And these are our guests today. Let us hear them speak. Let us hear truth. Speak truth to power, Sibongile and Stella. Thank you. Pagama, 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 Fazom Yama, Itresha, Itresha, Pagama, 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 Fazom Yama, Itresha, Itresha, Unity, Unity. Unity, unity. 
mama. Unity, unity. Unity, mfazo mnyama ite sa. Ite, owe unity, unity. Unity, mfazo mnyama ite sa. Ite sa. Unity, unity. Unity, mfazo mnyama ite sa. Unity, unity. It's a great honor to be here. Professors Zintabizetu Matebeni, Kumda Dinawa Kola, and Babala Makokwana, the universities of Nelson Mandela and Fort Hare, respective leadership. Thank you for this timely, necessary, and important work of excavating and surfacing the intellectual contributions of black women. Thank you for giving us the space to remember and be reminded that our work is made easier and possible because of those who walked before us. Their work is the truth that we should, can, and must build on because it's a reminder that progress that we make is not linear but still change is possible. There are other factors that impact on the quality of education of poor black children, but it is not only race. And that's some of the work that Dr. Phyllis Ntantala did. There are many things that access on HIV treatment, but it's not because there's a government that suddenly declared that it does not trust the efficacy of the drugs that were provided. So we thank the families of Prudence Mabele and Dr. Phyllis Ntantala for the gifts that we are left to remember them with. Auntie Pru, as she was affectionately known to some of us, lived truth. Sisongem Simang remembers that she never stopped working with the support groups even when donors stopped funding because the true new truth. She was what life for women happens in conversations. She knew that. So in the time it takes to sit with one another, those groups were emotional life support and she was always there for them despite the lack of donor funding. Auntie Prue is remembered for being one of the first people to get to the microphone in a room to protest and call out injustice wherever she saw it. Dr. Phyllis Ntantala documents the struggle for a just education. This is just a part of the work that she did and reminds us what it means to mobilize and that false narratives are ever present. She writes back into history the efforts to disappear what black parents and mothers did in resisting an unjust education system. She distinguishes between effective methods of mobilization and what it takes to engage, include, empower if social change is the desired outcome. The responsibility that teachers had at the time as thought leaders uh, in their communities. My comments this afternoon, uh, I feel taller than, <laughs> are going to focus on how the state, 
the South African government has engaged with the response to gender-based violence and femicide to urge us to speak through to us and for ourselves because as Chomsky says, power knows the truth. It is just busy trying to conceal it. When speaking, throughout history, different figures and texts have implored people to speak out for themselves, for others against injustice. But we also remember that many people have paid the ultimate price. We live in a context where Babita Diokoran paid the ultimate price with her life when she dared to speak out against corruption. We know Matsilo Mutei, the author of The Kanga and the Kangaroo, who dared to write about the Jacob Zuma rape trial, and she paid with her livelihood. The reverence and recognition of speaking as an act finds expression in the many ways that we seek to protect whistleblowers. We have organizations like One in Nine that says they are in solidarity with women who speak. But truth is something else. Truth has not enjoyed a degree of consistency that the act of speaking uh, has. Because speaking does not necessarily implore one to speak the truth. In some democracies, people who tell lies are also protected because what is protected is the right to speak. In some democracies, freedom of speech is curtailed only if it incites harm or violence. The dominance of misinformation and disinformation forces us to live in a world where truth and falsehood are not easily distinguishable. The strategies employed in the service of disinformation are getting sophisticated and effective by the day. So we know that in order to get to the truth, we need to invest in determining the truth, whether we set up commissions of inquiry, because there are so many truths out there. Truth needs to be uh, proven, and establishing truth just requires a lot of investment. We have multiple news sources, and the news that we get every day is deeply unpleasant. So when I come to speak tonight, I'm not here to just bury you, but it is also to ask you because of where you are placed for help. The meaning of what power is has evolved in good and bad ways. We have come to understand that power means different things, but today I'm only talking about one form of power and that is state power. I'm going to talk about five things that where government has demonstrated that power has a range of ways to respond to the truth that it hears. One of the main truths is that South Africa has got one of the highest levels of gender-based violence in the world. The president has referred to this situation as the second pandemic. In five days, it will be the fifth anniversary of the total shutdown when women dared to shut this country down because of the failure to effectively respond to gender-based violence and femicide. On that evening of the 1st of August, when the 24 demands were presented to the president, there was a conscious decision to engage with the state differently. It was a recognition that a multi-pronged approach was not only urgent, but extremely necessary. The engagement presented a possibility of winning through political mobilization. There appeared to be responsiveness of the political elite, the presidency in particular. The presidential summit that followed, the adoption of the, gender, of the declaration, the adoption of the National Strategic Plan on Gender-Based Violence and Femicide, and the follow-up presidential summit that was never asked for by civil society, but presented by the presidency as a commitment to ending gender-based violence and femicide. 
This is an opportunity that has been squandered. Government has the power because power approximates itself to the truth, and that's the first thing. On that 1st August, when the president arrived at the Union Building to accept the 25th, it began the process of approximating itself to the truth. There had been a precedent that women's rights activists would not march to, to give a memorandum other than ask to quit. But this was a president who was saying, I am here to engage, I am here to respond because I do take this seriously. Power creates the impression that it is listening and that it is determined to act accordingly. And that's what it did from that moment. We may not have asked for the second presidential summit, but we wanted it because it had been two years since the launch of the National Strategic Plan. And whilst its lack of prominence was understood because it arrived on the, in April 2020, just as we were dealing with the pandemic, we understood that there was to make up for the time that we had lost because of the COVID pandemic. So when government says, yes, we want to accelerate, we want to fast track, we want to account for the response, civil society thought that this was a good move and many people were mobilized and worked towards that process. But we also know that the second thing is that power ignores the truth that it does not want to hear. In September 2022, on the eve of the presidential summit, government published what it called the Reflections Report on what they did with the National Strategic Plan. And they had to account and give themselves a scorecard of how they had performed against the six pillars. What did they do? They measured themselves against indicators that are not in the National Strategic Plan, right? They had gone and deviated and implemented activities that they were never asked to do. They have an addiction to creating fast track routes that don't lead to anywhere. They established a private sector led fund, which was not in the national strategic plan because the national strategic plan said it needs to be a state fund. They decided to establish a trust on gender-based violence and femicide when the National Strategic Plan called for the establishment of a council with very clear functions. The second, the third thing, power deliberately creates vacuums so that it can tell different truths at different times. At the end of the first presidential summit, there was an interim steering committee that was established and worked towards the development of the National Strategic Plan. When the National Strategic Plan was adopted, that was the end of the interim steering committee and there was a vacuum because government said there was no civil society to engage with. For the second presidential summit, there was a presidential summit planning committee that had civil society. Shortly after the end of the second summit, even that, committee was disbanded unceremoniously. The truth that government wants to tell itself is that when there is a vacuum, it is because civil society is divided, because civil society cannot work together. The fourth thing, it's a strategy that the spiritual godfather of the disinformation campaign, Steve Bannon, called to flood the zone with shit. What this strategy does is to provide a lot of information that is conflicting. But disinformation differs from propaganda in that it does not necessarily want to create a different alternative narrative. It wants to disorient. It wants us to believe that there is nothing as the truth. So we do not know what to believe. We do not know what the truth is. And this has been the strategy that government has deployed in having conversations about the progress of this national strategic plan. 
an interministerial committee is one of the things that the National Strategic Plan establishes. We do not know if this committee sits or does not sit. We never get the minutes, we never get to understand what happens and what is the answer. They say the information is classified because it deals with intelligence. Why would it deal with issues of national security and intelligence if it is the one interministerial committee that is established to implement the national strategic plan with very clear um, functions? After the summit, there were a number of proposals that were developed in order to fast track because there was a recognition that we were stuck in the implementation of this 10-year plan. One of them included withdrawing the legislation that was already presented before Parliament in order to make the necessary amendments. Representative of the Department of Justice and Department of Women, Youth and People with Disabilities took turns arguing that it is impossible to withdraw legislation that has been placed before Parliament. And the work of civil society is to debunk these lies because there have been a number of legislation that have been withdrawn once they have been placed before Parliament. On the day of the summit, the Minister of Justice came to a lot of applause and said that the amendment to decriminalize sex work was before Parliament. A couple of weeks ago, we found out that at the same time, there was an existing opinion from the state law advisor that says this law may not pass constitutional master. It should not go ahead. Two weeks ago, they communicated that they are withdrawing this bill that had been open for public participation. And they will not give reasons why or what the opinion of the state law advisor says. There are a number of other things, including the very same legislation that establishes the council. This is tagged as a section 77.5 bill before parliament at the moment. And what is happening is that at the summit, the things that need to be added there does not allow this to proceed only in the National Assembly as a Section 75 bill because it has implications for provinces and municipalities. So it has to be re as a Section 76 bill um, because it needs to go to the National Council of Provinces. They haven't withdrawn it. They haven't re it. They are proceeding with it and they will come back and say, so the question really that we should ask ourselves is where to invest our efforts if we want to get maximum returns. Because some of us have made the decision to say we are disengaging and we are disengaging loudly. So this is part of that loud disengagement. But there will be others who need to go there because we know that they have a constitutional obligation that they owe us, that we have a right to be free from violence. But this is a question of energy. Who has got energy to deal with these levels of misinformation and disinformation whilst trying to do work? The most important thing to remember, which is my fifth point, is that power can be powerless or can act powerless. The impact of the super presidencies that uh, the super presidency that commentators have been talking about, the staffing and the presidency and all of these other structures that have been created there, forces us to ask this question once again is what are the powers that these people have? Because the implementing departments remain the Department of Women, Youth and Persons with Disability, Justice, Social Development and other government departments. What he said is that there are many people who mean very well and want to do their work, but it is not possible for them to do that. Minutes, meetings after meetings, it is the very same frustration that the power is powerless. The power is refusing to exercise powers that it has under the Constitution 
The national strategic plan says the president is the champion of this response, but there is no performance management. People who derail the process, nothing happens to them. They leave to fight another day and to derail more and more processes. So, in closing, we learned from Dr. Phyllis Ntantal about the responsibility that we must and that we have to empower and conscientize our communities so that we create conditions that make it possible to resist injustice. You are here, you are universities. We need evidence that is sound so that our interventions are based on evidence on what it takes to end gender-based violence and femicide. These investments, these conversations that we are starting, we are going to have to be willing to do it by ourselves and with each other because we have a state that is consistently proving that it doesn't have the political will to save us from the violence that it said it will. Thanks. Thank you so much for reminding us that sometimes power can approximate itself to the truth. Thank you so much. Colleagues, please welcome oh, Dr. Stella Nyatz. Thank you very much. Um, I'm short. <laughs> Is this good? Okay, I just have to make sure that I can see my writing as well. And I really appreciate um, Sibongile because she's asked for evidence. And while you began with state-centric power, I want to speak as evidence of the mergings. She spoke about the state. I will give you a biography of what it means to speak truth to power. And I need to make sure that I can see my notes again. Okay. So, what an honor it is for me to participate in this deeply spiritual gathering. To remember and commemorate Dr. Phyllis Ntantala. Thank you for teaching me the pronunciation. Have I got it right? And Prudence Mabele. I was told not to say Mabele. I celebrate the amazing three African feminists, Zetu, Pumla, and Babalwa, who conceptualized and birthed this collaboration project between these three universities, or two universities really, but three different, a chair in gender, sexualities, and queer studies, a chair on African feminist imaginaries or imaginations, and the Center for Women and Gender Studies at Fort Hare and Nelson Mandela University. The tour was amazing, and I want to say, just as Asanda said, we need to see those books. We need to touch um, what Phyllis wrote. We can't just read her work if we can't access it. So thank you very much for the tour. I appreciated it but make her works accessible to us, especially to those of us who are not living in Africa, who are in exile, and want to know more about these powerful women. Thank you for bringing the spirits of our feminist African ancestors and sisters, sisters and sisters, not ancestors. So every time I say ancestors and you hear ancestors, I'm saying ancestors, okay? Thank you, Zetu. Thank you, Pumla. Thank you, Babalwa for bringing into the university these two feminist African ancestors. Thank you for bringing them into the powerful colonial ivory towers that produce knowledge at the apexes of dominant hierarchies. This evening, I want to say to everybody present that I'm standing on the shoulders and I'm drawing strength 
I'm drawing voice and articulation because I arrived. What time did I arrive? I began traveling here on Monday and I arrived at uh, 1.30 today. But I'm drawing voice from their loud legacies. And I summon you, each one of you here present, but also online today and in the future. I'm summoning you, putting you in order. And I want you to speak truth to power. If I can speak truth to power, we had to get a podium with steps to put me high enough to speak. Who are you not to speak truth to power? And why I'm saying this is because as I tell you about my story and my journey, speaking truth to power, you will realize that you have no reason at all not to speak whatever truths, plural, to power that you represent. Speaking is a distinct human feature. Please remind me at 10 minutes and at 5 minutes because when I get started, I don't stop. Speaking is a distinct human feature that distinguishes us from both inanimate things. This thing does not talk because it's inanimate. It has no spirit. As well as animals. They don't speak. They say, and But we speak because we are human. To speak is to refuse to be dehumanized. It is a refusal to be silenced by whatever forces, whatever, whether it's the state or the community or the family or whatever individual fears we have as people. Right? Speaking is resisting and saying, no, 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 no. I want to be silent or silenced. Sometimes speaking is refusing self-silencing. Speaking truth to power is one way of resisting the tyranny of silence, tyranny, yeah? The despotism of silence, and thereby fulfilling our human purpose. In her seminal essay, um, after she'd been diagnosed with breast cancer, you know who I'm talking about. Yes, some people are nodding. Facing death and her mortality, Audre Lord, one of the ancestors, revealed that what she regretted most were her silences. In an essay she wrote, Transforming Silence into Language and Action, Umama Audre Lord said, I was going to die, if not sooner than later, whether or not I had ever spoken myself. As she was on that bed being told you have cancer, she says my silences had not protected me. And so you, <laughs> listening to me, your silence will not protect you. Whether you speak, you die. Whether you don't speak, you die. So you may as well speak. Right? Because we're going to die. And death, again in her essay, she says death is the final silence. It is imperative that those of us who lead in the building of warriors, I'm a warrior of speech, against oppressive silence, empower and teach by living as truth tellers, in igniting the fires of new truth tellers. We appeal to them by the clarion call of do as I do. So if you're not speaking, don't ask us to speak. But I dare invite you to be speakers of truth because I speak. When they punish me, I speak. When they imprison me, I speak. When they torture me, I speak. So I speak because I speak. And I'm still here, you know. I'm still here. In this regard, I myself have become a descendant in the lineage of great ancestors who include Dr. Phyllis Ntantala and Prudence Mabele, whose exemplary lives and life work we are here to commemorate. And so I celebrate that you are intentionally committing resources to share and expose these two profound South African, African, world exemplars of speaking truth to power with the world. We may be small in this small gathering here at Fort Hare. <laughs> this is world breaking. Yes. Who was Dr. Phyllis Ntantal? I saw her pictures in the library. Who was Prudence Mabele? I saw her pictures in the timeline you sent me. Who are these two women that I, a rebel, count an owner to claim among my ancestors. You see, I'm a warrior truth teller who consciously rejected many of those so-called Pan-African ancestors, those ones who are touted as heroes or heroines, 
Those sheroes and sheroines celebrated for leaving a mark on our human race. I rejected them. They're not my ancestors. You think about anyone. There was that one who came and is still living and was at UCT. He's not my ancestor, even if he's Pan-African. Upon closer probing and interrogation, many of your popular named ancestors maintained the status quo that produced my subjugation that continues today. I creatively disown them. I cut them out of my lineage of great giants on whose shoulders I stand because their works in diverse ways contributed to the perpetuation of oppressive social, political, and economic hierarchies that disempower my ilk. I'll tell you about my ilk in a moment. And so I'm very careful about whom I select to include in my ancestry. Don't give me your ancestors, those oppressors. I don't want them. But prudence, my belly. And Dr. Phyllis Ntantala, those ones are worthy and sisters. I am one in their lineage. They were born 51 years apart. Um, they were black African women, unashamed to speak up. They spoke loud, they spoke consistently, and they spoke with others, not alone. They organized other voices to speak against the injustices they and theirs faced. The testimonies of many attest to how they productively articulated, invisibilized, and dismantled oppression and exclusion among them. So I won't go into their histories or their stories or biographies because I think it's been showing and also um, people know. But I want to move and say that similar to these two powerful exemplars, I am a black African woman who was bathed and rebathed myself as a loud, insistent, defiant, persistent, and sometimes irritating speaker of bitter truth to multiple intersecting forms of oppressive power. Ten minutes, okay. Although my abrasive, acerbic, and sexually explicit dissident speech is what traveled and still travels the farthest, thereby earning me the name of Uganda's rudest poet, Uganda's most disrespectful feminist, and so on, I also speak gently softly, beautifully, pleadingly, and I can be tender. I can speak in a civilized, respectable manner with polished diplomacy and apply impotent platitudes. I can do all of that. Heck, my academic articles are predominantly very polite if you've read them and you quote them. You reproduce them and regurgitate them and in the same minute you call me the rudest African feminist. However, over the last two decades, just as she told us about what power can and cannot do, what power pretends to do, I have been learning that holders of oppressive power concede nothing without persistent struggle, and they pretend to be both deaf and blind to our plight. They pretend they don't hear when we are polite. Often, oppressive power totally ignores polite speech, particularly when these polite pleas are sporadic and disjointed. One time you say this, and then you protest that. It's not consistent, okay? Thus, rather than yield and give up in shameful defeat, I have learned the art of turning up the notch a little higher, a little higher, speaking louder, speaking longer, speaking in concert with others who both amplify and explicate what I say, when those at the helm of power in the oppressive systems and structures ignored my politeness, my civility, my respectability, and my diplomatic advocacy, I stopped the negotiations. I stopped being polite. I painted my voice with raw paint. My voice, not my body. Although some of you have seen my body with raw paint. Most of the times I'm dressed. And I pulled out the big guns of non-violent combat, namely satire. Sarcasm, irony, ridicule, mockery, hyperbole, innuendo, superlatives, and yes, even graphic imagery, graphic metaphors, similes, and all other forms of figurative symbolic language. I pulled them out. I swear, I do. I curse. I, I can call down fire and brimstone. I call the ancestors and I deploy the entire arsenal of words in the armory of the English language fed to me by my colonizers. When English fails to deliver the urgent demand for freedom, then I turn to French or German, and most powerfully, I turn to Luganda. 
That is the language of my bloodline. When I'm boiling and the English don't understand me, or the powerful don't understand me in the language of the powerful, I turn to the language of my ancestors and I begin to curse them. You see, I did not study poetry, literature in English, an English language for nothing. I studied language during the biggest part of my childhood and youth so that I could wage wars of words and defeat my oppressors. In fact, words are so powerful that military despots do not know how to counter them. You told us that sometimes power doesn't know what to do. They bring out guns, you bring out words. Right? As I have written in my published poems, word cannot be handcuffed nor shot with bullets. Are you going to shoot bullets at a word like... You know, words can neither be tear gassed nor beaten up with batons. In my case, as a Nalongo, meaning the mother of twins within Chiganda ethos, I have cultural license from my culture. One was a Sangoma, me am a Nalongo. I have cultural license to publicly deploy profanities, obscenities, and vulgarities, particularly when my children are threatened, when the state is threatened. In my culture, mothers of twins have permission. Therefore, any Muganda or African worth their name in salt would take it to the outbursts of Analongo, those Africans who are criticizing me and telling me it's not African to be disrespectful. It's not African to speak up <coughs> when you're educated with a PhD. Does your PhD take away your culture? <laughs> Especially when those words are acerbic and sustained in order to redress whatever injustices provoke the combative speech. So, however, in the case of different powerful men, families in power, public institutions and state actors that I called out, challenged, criticized, or outrightly condemned in Uganda, I more often than not faced, faced punishment and even plain persecution. The list of injurious counterattacks that I received is too long and gruesome to narrate here in full, but I will share a few choice highlights. Because of my words criticizing those who abuse public offices in the services of my oppression, whether at Makere University or in Uganda or in my family and clan, I have been imprisoned many times. I was charged twice with offensive communication against President Museveni, against his wife and family. I was sentenced to 18 months in maximum security prison where I was tortured to the point of losing my teeth and losing my baby in my first trimester of pregnancy. I was slapped with a travel ban that forbade me from leaving the borders of Uganda and was implemented when I was shamefully intercepted at the airport by anti-terrorist police who forcefully removed me off a plane. My persecutors, the prosecutors of, in Uganda, applied to a lower court chief magistrate to subject me to involuntary mental examination, arguing that the persistence and virulence of my words against powerful actors could only come from a mentally sick person. So they think that one must be mad to speak truth to power. I lost my job, permanent and pensionable at Makere University because I criticized the president's wife for being minister of education. She got there through nepotism, yet she lacks requisite education. She dropped out of school in Form 2. How can she be Minister of Education? My house and office premises were raided several times by armed officers who sometimes found my minor children at home. And part of the cost for me has been what it has done, not just to me, but also my children who are minors. My personal vehicle was trailed, even on trips to and from my children's schools. So I could go on and on and on about what happened, phone calls being tapped, bank account being you know, blocked, etc., etc. When the persecutions became too intense to stomach any longer, I fled for my life. I fled that country. I fled that community. I fled and said, Uganda, I'm not your mother. Go and find a mother who is polite. And I fled first to neighboring Kenya, where I briefly applied for asylum, and later to Germany, where I currently live in exile as a scholarship holder of the Writers in Exile program of Penn Germany. Today I live in exile because of the power of words. Why am I not home? <laughs> While many mock me claiming that my exile is evidence that non-violent um, uh, struggle that I gave up the non-violent struggle for liberating Uganda, I gave up the struggle against patriarchy and 
homophobia and extractive capitalism in Uganda, I rebut that exile is neither retreat nor surrender. Exile does not take away my tongue or my pen. Did I run away and leave my tongue in Uganda? Or those big words, did I leave them in Uganda? I carry them to exile. So exile is a time to re-strategize. I also add that a dead soldier cannot fight anymore. Although an exiled one can keep on shooting words from her pen, her mouth, and through her collectives of support. I hope I have elucidated enough that sometimes speaking truth to power can be damn right dangerous. These experiences are not unique to me, but were encountered by most who tread this path. And I was talking about Dr. Antantala who lived in exile in the U.S. with her husband. I wanted to talk about Nawal El Sadawi. I wanted to talk about Prudence Mabele um, and how women ostracized her because I, said I faced the same ostracization from feminists, from human rights organizers, from my family who were threatened, etc., etc. I also wanted to talk about a woman called Wangari Mathai who was called mentally ill because she challenged the president in Kenya against environmental extractivism and deforestation, but I won't go into all those people. So... Regardless of these challenges, I've shown you it's dangerous. I'm inviting you to something dangerous if you haven't been doing it. Regardless of these challenges, we must resist the urge to yield to silence or even much worse, empty praise of repressive power. It is important to continue speaking truth to power because it is effective in multiple ways. If the situation of oppression or injustice or the inequality that you're facing is not immediately addressed, the oppressor is exposed. How else do we expose these things if we don't speak about them? Maybe they won't go away. And people have said to me, so when you used those big words, did it change? No, but you know about it. How many people knew that Professor Mahmoud Mamdani, in spite of his scholarship, was also an abuser of black women, young women in the university? He was an abuser of contracts. If I hadn't exposed him with my words, poetry, on Facebook, online and offline, who would not know? Or who would know? So all I'm saying is, maybe Mamdani is still a professor. I wasn't touching his professorship. I was questioning the audacity to use an office badly. Maybe Museveni is not yet out of office in State House, but I have questioned and exposed him. And people know me as the woman who called the president in Uganda a pair of buttocks. So I see you looking at your time because it's probably time for me to end. I will end here and we can discuss strategies of how to speak, when to speak and when not. If Prudence Mabele said to Zuma, you're a rapist, we must keep calling out the rapists and pointing our fingers at them. And if they don't listen, we undress in public to shame them. Thank you very much. Aha! Thank you so much, colleagues. Um, thank you so much, Stella, for reminding us that there's precarity in speaking. There's danger in speaking, but we have to go on. Professor Pumla Gona, please take over. We promised you bold Zetu when she was introducing our two wonderful keynote speakers said these are bold women these are dangerous women dangerous to patriarchy dangerous to power I think having listened to both of them you know Zetu was telling the truth When I, so I'm going to, you didn't come here to listen to me, so I'm going to be in conversation with them, and then just to explain how this is going to work, and then I'll take a few questions um, from, from the audience. I won't pose questions, I'll pose reflections. I don't know why I'm in this higher chair, because it's hard to, to see my troublemaking sisters. So I want to start my conversation with the two of you. Um, by sharing two things. I don't have Swongile's permission. I hope you don't mind. When I talked to Swongile about um, in one of our conversations about, about tonight, and I was saying, no, it's you and Stella. She said, Swongile has a, 
um, came back again of a, a, a very dry sense of humor. She said, what, did you, Babalwa and Zetu, decide to get the two jailbirds? <laughs> and I think that question, playful but serious, says much about the cost of speaking truth to power, which I, both of them have spoken so powerfully to in very different, in different ways. And of course, definitely in the spirit of Phyllis Ndandala, I was um, very fortunate to also be in the audience in, the, in the, one of the last seminars that Dr. Ndandala gave at um, VETS. She was advanced in age, but her rage at the violence, at structural violence against women in this country was palpable. It was clear, and I know often women's anger, feminist rage, all women's anger is often belittled, dismissed, mocked. I think today we hear the clarity of vision that comes with feminist rage from both these speakers, and I certainly heard it that day from Dr. From Dr. Ndandala, and she spoke, I think, in ways that um, she spoke of something that speaks to both of what you've spoken about today. She was particularly angry at the ways in which we talk about and think about and obscure women's contributions, women's political, radical women's political um, contributions to history. And so, in some ways, she was engaging the topic of speaking truth to power because she was saying women speak truth to power in radical and powerful and interesting ways, but we very often ignore the consequences of that work. And we recognize, and it's important to recognize the variety of consequences, including the seemingly civil, more polite, the ones that pretend not to be violent, so they don't slap you across the face, but they don't teach you. They reduce you to the status of the wife of. And one of the examples I like to cite from that, I probably cited too much, but it was one of my favorites. She talked about how she said, you know, very often radical women are reduced to being appendages. It's the wife of a powerful man. And the assumption is always that he that they're heterosexual, and that he radicalized her. And she spoke of a range of women whose names we know, but again, Stella's provocation, who wrote, who spoke, we know their names, but their words, their truth speaking to power does not circulate. And it doesn't circulate because we don't teach it. We don't cite it. We don't buy it, we don't read it, we don't reprint it, right? So the mere fact of speaking truth to power does not guarantee that future generations will even know. And I'm thinking also, of course, this links very powerfully to Prudence's, Prudence Mabele's work across her life on gender-based violence, but also, of course, the ways in which speaking truth to power, the radical woman speaking truth to power, does create something else. It doesn't just lend itself to our annihilation. It also creates the many ways in which we sit here today because of the truth-telling that Ndandala and Mabele created. Many things we take for granted as women in the academy, in the line of Phyllis Ndandala, Many ways in which we think about our sexuality, the taken for grantedness of ARVs in this country. I think it's important to remember they were still killing people when Prudence publicly revealed her HIV status. So this risk is real. And so I wonder, the two of you, Swangile, you talked about how power also ignores what is inconvenient. Um, and, 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 and the ways in which um, we are constantly pressured to think about, to speak in very particular ways. 
and that that relationship between speaking and truth are not, are not, are not automatic. So I thought there were so many synergies between between the particular, and it's wonderful, of course, when you see these synergies, because you didn't talk to each other, we didn't know, nobody knew what you were going to talk about, and so these wonderful synergies are always um, such a gift. And so I wonder then if you two, um, you don't have to respond to me, but if you do, you, you, you're welcome to, or to um, each other. I don't know who wants to, I'll start with you. Okay. Well, Stella, you said a lot, I think, about the price, you know, of um, speaking and um, how you paid, you know, the ultimate price in, in, in many ways, you know, the impact on your, your family, your, your job, um, and all that has come, you know, into living, you know, in, in exile. And you also talk about the the feminist, I think the dissenting, you know, voices um, from feminists. What, and I also mentioned, I think, supporters, you know, that continue, you know, to be there, you know, in this journey. What I would like to know more is what was that about, especially the feminists, you know, what with those dissenting voices, you know, from feminists, you know, because I think um, the intra-group dynamics, you know, the silencing within, you know, our own voices um, can be j just as painful, if not more, you know, than, you know, the others, you know, when, yeah, the, the feminism itself is questioned, you know, uh, through those... Um, Act. So, yeah, that's what I would like to know more. Yeah, so I, yeah, it got me thinking, you know, um, about what does it mean to be in solidarity, you know, with women who speak, um, and also what does it mean when feminists do not stand in solidarity with a feminist who chooses, you know, to speak um, when we are saying that um, this is what sisterhood or whatever it is that holds us together as feminists a commitment to the feminist methods of surfacing, you know, consciousness raising and all of those things. Um, yeah. Um, so w one of the things that has happened with my work, and I call it work, whether it's Facebook or poetry or uh, my publications or even the activism that I do, is that the feminist sisterhood has shown itself true. Just as families are difficult, we don't like our sisters all the times. We disagree on many things. I, I'm, I'm born with three other sisters and many stepsisters and half-sisters, but we fight over so many things. I think part of my learning has been to live with the disappointment of solidarity and to live with the solitude of a solidarity that says, I will Stand in solidarity with you as long as you sound like me and dress like me and you protest like I do. You think about power the way that I do. Many feminists, especially in elite places, at universities, in civil society organizations, those who have money, benefit from the status quo. Whether it's at the state level, at the community, or in the family, they don't want disruptors because they are part of the system. I do a lot of work with queer people, for example. Uganda's feminists are very moralist and heterosexist and very homophobic, and they wouldn't touch a queer person. Transgender women don't qualify for feminist spaces in some of the feminist places where I organize, and yet the solidarity is important because they have the access and the power, and if they carry you, you run miles. I think the other thing is my methods, like I said, if politeness doesn't serve me, I didn't study poetry. So that I could only do poetry that's polite. Satire. You know, calling a president a pair of buttocks doesn't mean the physical buttocks. That is what the Ugandans were obsessed about. But it's, it's using language to make true, very dirty language, and my language are very polite people. And women especially are polite. So breaking those boundaries of what traditional feminist morality and respectability is like really upset very many women. And I had feminists saying, 
We don't undress in protest. And I'm like, when did we start dressing up? When did we start putting on clothes made of cotton? When? This is colonial, right? The Christianization of the feminist movement back home, the religiosity and moralizing within movements that is so isolating. And so if my methods are not in tune and in sync, and then there are those feminists who say, but your protests are not theorized. No, 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 like the academic is demanding that we theorize street protests. We theorize our music and our art and our graffiti. Like, how dare you? Come and theorize from the protest. You know, feminist professor Sylvia Tamale, an amazing, beautiful mentor, had the audacity to come to a naked protest I staged at Makere University and to tell me to put on my clothes. I was still in my panties and ranting and swearing at the university. And she says, put on your clothes. And I say to her, I will remove my little black panty if you keep on telling me to put on my clothes. If you don't want to participate, go away or be silent. Right? She's a feminist professor of law. She's produced bodies of knowledge that we look up to. She's telling me to dress up and be respectable before these patriarchs and misogynists of the university. What better way to insult them than with my breasts? Isn't that feminist and powerful? Feminists have said to me that the you, the, the, the poem that took me to, 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 to jail, I mean, I've talked too much, I should stop, but the, the poem that took me to jail where I used the vagina, excuse me if you're scared of the vagina, and, and the, the president's mother's vagina, I write about it in seven stanzas. And these feminists were saying, how can she be a feminist and use the vagina against the president? And I was like, what is most feminist than the vagina? The president doesn't have it, patriarchs don't have it, they just like to, to use it. So what is not feminist about this vagina? Let's publicize it and embarrass the president with our vaginas. That is feminism. That is radical. What is more radical than that? And when feminist says she used a vagina and the whole media is talking about the vagina and in courtrooms they're talking about the vagina. I'm like, God, we have them. <laughs> and if you don't have it, you probably like it. Unless, of course, you are same-sex loving then you empathize with it because your mother had it and you came from it. So when feminists begin to see the vagina as hey, it's not feminist, like, what's wrong with you? You know? It's like Africans saying Sangomas are witches. We are African. We, are he we heal ourselves like that. When Nalongo profanes, that is what African feminists are supposed to say. Yes, she's our sister. They do that. So part of it is a failure to know who we are and the values that we stand for. And why? Because we have listened to patriarchs writing for us about who we are and what we do. And we have failed to debunk when you are saying, question this received knowledge. Question the disinformation. We have imbibed and swallowed a lot of disinformation that has polluted us and made us poisoned. And I think the unlearning work which Phyllis Tantala calls for is important and on that note I'll, I'll keep quiet but I wanted to ask you about unfunding and support like you said um, the law of speaking truth to power is unfunded the work we do and I thought it's the most so there's so many funders and funding bodies from the World Bank all the way down to women's, women credit schemes or commercial banks and I was wondering, the most important work to impact lives is this truth speaking, followed with action. Why don't we get funding? Why are they funding things that waste their money, apart from corruption? Because corruption is the song I've been hearing from the time I entered this country. Apart from corruption, what is it that stops the funding of this important work that we do? Why don't they see it's easy to tick the boxes and get accountability by funding this sort of work that we do. And lastly about solidarity that so the three stories I'm going to talk about that I think for me they've been feminist women and human rights organizations and other solidarity groups, African groups, Pan-African groups that stood in solidarity with me in spite of those that did not. And also many who did not, such as Sylvia Tamale eventually get it and they begin to explain the sort of work I do to others so what does solidarity mean? We, we are learning and we are theorizing and we must write about it. Thank you.
Yeah, the, the funding question is a difficult one for me because uh, even though some of us have called for different ways of funding mom, uh, movements, you know, um, the Black Feminist Fund uh, was set up and it says that it wants to fund movements like it wants them to win. You know, uh, so just thinking about what is the work that matters, what changes uh, need to be done there. One of the things that happened in the National Strategic Plan, and I think one of the questions about the Gender-Based Violence Fund, was to really think about low barriers, you know, to, to funding. So really thinking about how many big funders say they don't want to give money to small NGOs. And in South Africa, for example, there is a very fragmented uh, regulatory framework for non-profits, uh, community-based organization, and NGOs. So it's very hard for many people to comply you know, with the funding requirements uh, and all of that. And so the intentionality when we're talking about what kind of a fund do we want you know, to, uh, to establish, um, the the kind of people who make those decisions about what gets funded. So where you have um, the communities themselves that are responding, being part, you know, of the uh, funding decisions, so that the money actually goes to where um, it is needed, but it is also distributed by people who actually understand, you know, what is the work that really uh, needs to to happen. So. I do not know why funding is not made available, but I think there has been quite a lot of thinking around what can make funding accessible to people who are doing this most important work on, um, yeah, almost every day where they, who are not able to access these funds. I have a few questions of both of them, but I'm going to hold them um, because I would like um, part of the spirit of feminist conversation is that you be in conversation with our speakers as well. So if I can get a sense, I'm sure there's a roving mic. Is there a roving mic? There is, right? There are two roving mics. Um, so can I get an indication if for so someone who have a question or a comment, if it's a comment, please don't make a speech. Um, just keep it brief. No one after all of these. Okay. I see. Okay. Sorry, I want, no, I see, I see, I just want to see who the third person is. Okay, so we'll start with the person at the back. Her hand was, uh, that person's hand was in the blue. And then we will come to Asanda, and then we will have a question from Princess. Please go ahead. And maybe if you can tell us your name or something, so that we know, so that we know, they know who they're addressing. Okay, all right, thank you so much. So I am Bomika Zinjoloza, and my question is about the balancing work, right? We do know what the consequences are, and I think uh, you ladies have sort of shared some of your experiences. Uh, but then what, what Dr. Stella also mentioned, spoke to how uh, a dead soldier cannot fight. So there's a level of self-preservation work that goes to, um, you know, your activism work, um, whatever shape it takes. Form. So what's the balance, and what's some of the behind-the-scenes sort of balancing work that goes to staying alive, but then still doing the work? Thank you, Bobby Gazi. Um, Asan, at the front, second row. Great, thank you. Thank you so much to our two keynote speakers. I think you are a gift to us. I'm really grateful to have been here. Uh, I think part of the question's already been asked, but my other question was around what you both kind of talked about re-strategizing Stella. Uh, and I'm thinking about both the, uh, what you, you spoke about, Spongile, speaking more about the work that collectives have done and where power has, and how power has responded. But Stella, speaking more about the work that you've done as an individual, and I was wondering about a midway between the two in thinking about and re-strategizing, because it seems to me, as the other person who's asked the question has said, that, you know, we dead soldiers can't fight. So the individual route has a lot more, you, you're more exposed, but also within the collective ways in which we've been waging struggles, it seems to me that there's a lot we need to reimagine. So I was wondering if you can elaborate more on that re-strategizing, in addition to the question you had posed, Bungil, about where, 
or I think you said where to invest our energies. I'm, 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 I'm interested in how we invest these energies also. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Princess Sibanda. The vagina talk really was something important for me, and I can't think of anything as radical as deconstructing the narrative of the alpha dick. And I think when you do the work and recenter the vagina, um, there's a lot, there's a revolution there. I just thought I would slide out that thank you for the vagina talk and thank you for the vagina poem. Um, I think my question also builds on to what she asked around social justice and mental health. Um, I guess it's the balance, but also to say what is at stake and also the keyboard warriorship that you do, Dr. Stella Nyanzi. Uh, what are the opportunities and what are the risks that come with that? Because there's a lot of cyberbullying as well. Um, so I just thought I'd ask around keyboard warriorship and mental health. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, those are the only questions we're taking, but I'm going to ask um, Swangile and Stella in opposite order um, this time um, to to answer those to answer those questions. And perhaps if they have any closing comments around, and I'm particularly interested in in, in closing comments or their reflections on 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 connections. Um, both of their work is quite mobile. They work in very different ways. Mongila did not talk about the fact that she works all over um, the, 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 the continent and strategic feminist litigation rather than what we ordinarily, what the, we non-lawyer people usually think what a feminist lawyer does is represent individual um, people, but actually part of um, a very important component of Swongila's work is, 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 is making connections across the continent around sexualities and, and, and violence and, 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 gender, and, gender, and gender power. And so if you could share some, some, some insights from that. And then maybe just, um, you've spoken about the dangers, you've both been in jail for being dangerous and bold. What, and yet you continue this work. Right? We know the politics of why you continue this work. You've told us very powerfully, but perhaps you can share with us also about what continues to, um, how you continue to do this work at a, at, a, at a personal level. What energizes you? Because you certainly provoked and energized us intellectually, creatively, emotionally, and in, and in effective ways. So, um, Stella, I'm going to give you first. That's a lot. So, if you, you can pick and choose, but you have to answer the one about. Okay, so I went to jail for the vagina poem. Thank you for appreciating because, again, truth, who's truth, right? And decentering the alpha dick, that's part of the work that I do. It doesn't take an intellectual to, to get there. It looks like a joke. It looks like a heap of obscenities, but it's hard work. And there's theory there. Uh, mental health is important. I think two things there. The state the oppressors have always used uh, insanity, the law, psychiatry, and medicine to ostracize and other loud women, especially loud women who challenge power. And sometimes when people have said to me, what do you do about your, men your own mental health? They are echoing the, you are mad. And I hear it and I see it. And I think part of what that does is to discredit um, and dismiss the work that we do. It's hysteria. She's being hysterical. I mean, your periods, okay? But the other really important work that we have to do as feminists, as organizers, as African people, but also as just human beings, is to take care of our mental health. And I think part of solidarity and support does it, delegating and teaching, mentoring and getting mentors, taking time off, knowing you're not alone. There's a whole thing around mental um, mental health, Be because of the accusations of the state and the, you know, slapping with involuntary mental examination, I had to go and see a psychiatrist and say, assess me. What, what, what is my diagnosis? ADHD, bipolar, schizophrenia. And they say, you're so normal. But what does it mean for the government to say to me, you're normal? 
It means you don't need counseling. It means you don't need support. It means you're fine. <laughs> so again, what truths do we look for and where do we gain our support? I think for me that in terms of um, sisterhood and solidarity, I have learned more and more to take a break. And exile for me is a good, good break. Although some people look at it as weakness. How do I continue my work is related to re-strategizing um, and is related to a dead soldier cannot fight, I think. So I'll answer those three with one shot to say part of what I should have done better was to collaborate more. And so your collaborative work is important. I wasn't waiting for people who felt my fire was too hot. If it's too hot for you in my kitchen, go and start your own damn fire, but do something. That was my attitude a lot of the times. And so when I took to very exclusionary and exclusive methods such as social media, I don't need anybody to retweet if I tweet. I can tweet on my bed, tweet alone. And then I learned, oh, the feminist ninjas who will run with my message and retweet it and it will become global. So part of what I should have done much better was to ally with others and maybe to be a bit more patient with idiots in the movement, idiotic sisters, people who, who see the, they see where you are a lot, a lot later. They're derailing and delaying you. And I think um, the other thing about re-strategizing is because I have different knowledge forms. I'm not just an academic and academics won't deny me. I am not just a poet, but poets won't deny me, is that others have run with my work. My work is taught. My poetry is recited by others. It's been translated. My protests, I'm, I'm invited as a protester. Come and teach us how. And I'm like, I didn't, nobody taught me how to undress. You don't need like lessons in how to undress. You need rage <laughs> and no alternatives. There were no alternatives when I Every time I've thrown off my dresses when you're in court before the high court magistrate and you're on a screen, you're not even given the decent option of a fair trial to go and stand in court. What do you do? In court, the court is violating your right to have a fair hearing. And there are cameras before you and you have your body. You throw off your clothes. But how do you teach women to throw off their clothes in protest? when women's bodies have been refused to be put on the line. So in terms of re-strategizing, I think you guys are going to have to do the re-strategizing for me or for you or for whoever else. I've been asked to do the radical, radical rudeness school of thought. And I thought, what is that? I wasn't beginning a thought or continuing a tradition when I began what I was doing. People want to do a radical rudeness school, get the resources, get the classes, get the things. I've done the work. So if you need it, maybe I'm dead like Phyllis Tantella is dead. I'm dead. Imagine I'm dead. I'm gone. I'm in exile. Do the work yourselves. Don't call me back to the party. After all, you didn't like it when I was there. Right? So do the work. I've done it. And so part of the strategy is also said no. Asanda, I'm not coming to your city to protest. I'm not coming. You go and do the protest. I undressed. Maybe you stay in your clothes, but hold placards. Raise your middle fingers up to some professors. Okay? I've done the work. Why should I re-strategize? I'm on holiday. But exile is not forever. I'm coming back home. Maybe when Museveni dies or after my children are independent to take care of themselves, then I'll go home and go back to prison. Thank you very much. But it's still dangerous and still necessary. Thank you. The middle path, um, Asanda, there are quite a number of people who have made a deliberate decision not to work with movements in the same way that there are people who are making decisions not to work with the state. And so I think there is a middle path um, somewhere there. We, we understand the violence of working with movements. It's different from the violence of the state but there is violence nevertheless. But we do need to have all hands on deck. You know, we, it's self-preservation. People are not going to meetings. Um, people in academia always feel attacked when they go uh, into movement spaces sometimes. 
um, the role of the expert or even the contestation about the meanings of knowledge. Um, we, in the gender-based violence space, we understand how knowledge has been used to disempower, de-radicalize, but really marginalize and uh, push people further from the margin, especially black women, you know, in this um, work. Um, but that should not be the reason for not working with people who have, you know, this knowledge and expertise because they still a role for people who have expertise on what it means to end gender-based violence and femicide. So the balance between self-preservation and people feeling like it is so hard to do movement work. Movement work is always going to be a struggle. Um, it is where we are, where we come from, what civil society has meant, the basis for it in South Africa that puts us in this position. So some of us, we leave, we come back, you know, but um, we do need to find a way for people to write in the corner wherever they are. You know, um, the circles can be many and we can make all difference, but there is one playbook that we need to be playing from right now in terms of our response. I believe that the National Strategic Plan is a very decent document and it's really where our efforts, and it doesn't matter who we work with or who we do not work with, that in our own work, where we are, we can find a way to contribute to one, at least one of the six pillars. There's a pillar on accountability, governance, uh, leadership, and coordination of the response. People who do that work, we need your resources there to talk about accountability, about m monitoring the response. We need people who are able to speak truth to that power, to say that this is not properly coordinated. We need people who understand prevention of violence, what it takes to prevent violence, the attitudinal changes, and all of that that we need, how we start with this, you know, from early. The criminal justice system, we pay them our taxes, but they are still very much in charge of our police stations, our courts, and everywhere, and we cannot allow them, you know, to just continue to dismantle the system we want to provide care, support, and shelter, and that has changed, you know, over the years, but we understand what it means to care and support victims and survivors of gender-based violence. But academic institutions, there is pillar six, where there is research that needs to be done on this response, and we need, you know, everyone there. One of the new pillars in a national strategic plan on gender-based violence and femicide is the pillar that deals with economic empowerment. We know, uh, we saw this weekend when the new executive of the NC Women's League came forward and how they were talking about this. But we do not know whether this means that we are safe from the same kind of patronage, you know, and um, deployments that cripple our state institutions. So even if we set up this council, what it means for the people who are elbowing each other, you know, to go and sit there. So I think it is important for us to think about where we are going to contribute, but there is no shortage, you know, for the spaces where uh, we can, you know, contribute, even if we don't want to go into spaces that are filled with so many people that can hurt us. I'm going to hand over to Babalwa in a second. Thank you, Swongile. Thank you, Stella, for your analysis, for your clarity, for your work. Um, thank you for filling us with feminist hope and feminist rage and feminist joy. Um, and I'm going to, Babalwa, I'm going to just hand over to you. I don't know what I'm supposed, are we supposed to get up? I'm supposed to stay? The one time I take instruction. <laughs> Thank you so much, colleagues. I cannot begin to thank you enough for what you have done. But we do have uh, Professor Andre Kiet, um, who is, represent, who is a Deputy Vice-Chancellor uh, for Engagement and Transformation Portfolio at Nelson Mandela 
university to do that for you. But I do want to say this about Andre. He said, don't read the bio. I think one of, one of the things that I just need to say about um, Andre is that when you see the Center for Women and Gender Studies at Mandela, when you see the chair of African uh, feminist imagination, you must know that there were resources, time, hands, and everything that were dedicated to pull through those two entities. And Andre was the biggest engine behind that kind of work. So that is, for me, the introduction for you, Andre. Please come to Got a lot of presents here as well, and then of course, I thought uh, maybe I am as tall as Neil, and then I realized. Let me just maybe Stella, the two of us, <laughs> are more connected. So, uh, friends uh, and colleagues, uh, you know, and the amazing young people, of course, uh, in this uh, venue. Thank you so much for uh, joining us. I would like to, to acknowledge the Mabele family, the Ntantala and Balfour families, as well as the leadership from both our university and the University of Fort Hare. And of course, the speakers, Sibungile and Dashe. Oh, it was great relinking with you, amazing. And of course, Stella and Yanzi, staff, uh, you know, and our virtual audience as well. Many thanks for joining us from different parts of the world, but also from different institutions. Now, our Mandela and Ford hair gender teens, are, they are indeed something, eh? and they are extraordinary in different ways. So, so you get requested to, to do a vote of things, and then you just say, okay, right, send me the list of the people that needs to be thanked, and then you get an entire speech to deliver. Now, of course, now when a vote of things is unilaterally changed, to closing remarks with a team like this, and you just oblige. You, there's nothing else that you can do about that. And it's not only because they are from our institutions, but because they do their work at the convergence of love and justice, a theme that holds this very short thank you note together. So please bear with me, it won't be long. The Phyllis Ntantala and Prudence Mabele joint public lecture, as you have heard, was inaugurated at Mandela University last year and today, of course, speaking truth to power, the first one hosted here at the University of Fort Hare. In fact, I was here 2008 to 2011, so it's great to be back as well. My office was just down the road here. And so the public lecture is significant for the way in which it honors two South African women who have contributed tremendously to the struggle for justice, particularly for women, and countering the erasure of women's activism, advocacy, and intellectual contributions in the history of this country. And of course, when you have a panel like this, uh, you know, one almost feel inadequate, you know, to make comments on top of those comments as well. But these kinds of things need to be done. Prudence Mabele's feminist work, including championing the rights of those living with HIV AIDS, was groundbreaking at a time when treatment was just, uh, beginning to be, was just beginning to be available. And of course, Pumla reminded us about this. She was a driving force in addressing issues around stigma and discrimination, especially because black women were disproportionately affected by the epidemic. Phyllis and Tantala fought tirelessly against the Bantu education system under apartheid and foregrounded the historic role played by African women. Now, of course, an entire intellectual scholarship project, you know, with huge practical import that's been driven by our two universities. So many thanks for that. So the public lecture is a small token of recognition for lives lived at the very edge of service to humanity, that of Ntantala and Mabele. This lecture is also important for this, for this collaborative effort and nature that we 
are trying to forge in the context of universities that have become overly competitive within our higher education system because these two sets of colleagues and these two sets of institutions, they're well aware that it's through our collaboration that we would be able to better engage the social justice concerns across the globe. So our relationship uh, with Fort Hare is based on an understanding and commitment uh, that we need to emphasize the critical interrelationship between the social and the epistemological and crafting practices that acknowledge, affirm, and humanize. Practices rooted in lives like that of Mabele and Dantala, practices of love and justice. There is thus a deep connection, at least for me in my reading of today, between these lives and the lives that the terrific gender teams from Mandela and Fort Hare are trying to unburden through their work in our sector and in our society. For that we are grateful. Thanks to all who took time to attend physically and to the online audience as well. And of course, thank you to our great speakers, Sibongile and Stella. A big hand to them, please. <laughs> they are the embodiment of an intergenerational community of intellectuals and feminist activists rooted in the spirits of Mabele and Tantala. And of course, when you have time, colleagues, Pumla, Zetu, Babalwa, you will also have to reflect on intergenerationality as a scholarship orientation, you know, in the real sense of driving uh, the notion of justice forward. I've always been amazed at the way, in we, in the way you get that right. So for, in relation to, our, to Sivongile and Stella, uh, you know, we stand in admiration for the work that you are doing. And so it is clear that what deeply connects the two feminist activists in whose name we are gathered today, that is Ntantala and Mabele, what connects them with our speakers and of course our organizers is the justice love interplay in the very work and lives at play in this public lecture. Like a love for justice that fuels rage and radical scholarship and practices. Dumza Maswana, thank you so much for your extraordinary musical renditions and of course to the marketing and communications teams, particularly the institutional advancement team, Soleik and Alida. Thanks so much for promoting this wonderful event. Thank you also to the IT and sound technicians for the work behind the, the scenes. And then, you know, to Zetu, Pumla and Bababa once again, to you and your organizing teams, Belita, Tandi, Princess, Bokazi, Wendy, Kanyasile, Kama, and Simran. Thank you so much for all the work. Now, many, many thanks for coming, colleagues. And now the last act of the day is for me to hand out these great gifts, of course. Uh, perhaps I'm not so sure who's going to assist me with that. I suppose that uh, we will also have to... Have oh, thank you so much. Uh, the one is for Sibongile, and the one for Stella, and one for Dumza. Where is Dumza around? Mm. Mm. Now, of course, how this needs to be done is with a flag of like a kind of a formal thing here, so that the vote yes, and so can. Uh, <laughs> Dumza, over to you. Thank you so much. 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 Thank you so much.
colleagues, we can now enjoy the last act of the day from Udumza. Thank you so, so much. Molo.
mazana, no mazana. Por eso cuano, 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 no mazana, no mazana. Chugar en un huevo, no me cuano, no me cuano. No me cuano, no me cuano, no me cuano. Todos los amos de la vida. Thank you. 
Thank you, thank you very much. And now we are going to do a beautiful song by Utada Utoli Koduka. Um, anyone knows Utada Utoli Koduka from Mdanzane? So this is a song from him. So I just wrote lyrics from this wonderful song. Lengoma. I 
But at least school fees is my door. Yama Liam, Yama Doko. Me, this is the God to win. Me, this is the God to win. Me, this is the God to win. Malayiko, Malayiko. Malayiko, Malayiko. Malayiko, Malayiko. For no bagger for London, let's supersede it. I know they love the song so much. They don't want me to leave the stage without singing this one. And I'm sure you will join us. He got his chevelets and jalo, mama. He was a new mama. Nanda mama. He got his chevelets and jalo, mama. He was a new mama. Nanda mama. 